this is a point where you and I have had some discussions, and I want to unpack this a little bit because talking to a lot of our peers, colleagues, competitors, and our clientele, quite frankly, Agile is a commonly heard refrain as far as something we all, in one way or another, aspire to. There's this better way, and it's called Agile to do. And then on the other side, there's we all have been following waterfall. So there's these two little cliche words here. The thing that's common when I talk to those of us that are building things, not just software, is Agile's very, very difficult to understand and to implement. And there's the constant toe of, well, this is the way we've always done it. I know we want to be better, but this is the way we've always done it. We're just going to stick with what we're doing. So maybe what we could unpack or you can unpack for us is, can you help, help our audience know what does waterfall look like today? How do you recognize that waterfall culture? What does something that, you know, we've called it agile, but we're talking about design sprints with voltage control here. What does that look like as far as an, uh, an organizational operation? And why would we want that uh, uh, design sprint instead of waterfall? Mm -hmm. in a more basic sense, because there's a, a lot of confusion there. Sure, sure. Well, waterfall is basically designing or specifying everything that's going to happen and then going to build it. So it's building a comprehensive plan and trying to think of all the interdependencies that need to go into um, and need to be considered and then kind of working out all the math and everything that you need in order to accomplish this. So in a way, it's like um, how you might build a house, right? So mm -hmm. you're going you're gonna to build all the blueprints and everything's totally figured out um, down to like, you know, the location of every single pipe and yeah. every single wire. And then you go and you hand that to a contractor and psh, they go build it. Build it. Um, and when we talk about knowledge work and so whether that be software, hardware, or even service design, um, and we ha we're dealing with a complex adaptive system because so we have customers and we have a market that's all moving and changing. Right. We have to have a system that allows us to react to those things. And so that's what Agile is really about. And a lot of, a lot of people um, get hung up on a lot of the Agile methodology, so Scrum yeah. and whatnot, because and, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a bit hard to unpack because it's this abstract philosoph philosoph philosophy. Right. And so... Um, so the thing, I just encourage people to go back to the philosophy, go really try to understand the mindset and not worry so much about, about the practices. Cause it's really easy just to say, okay, let me go just understand, let me just go follow these like types of meetings and things. And, and ultimately the philosophy says that we need to be agile, adaptable because the, the landscape's going to change. And right. also not only is the landscape changing, but our understanding of the landscape is probably incorrect. And so we're gonna have assumptions. We always have assumptions. And the most dangerous ones are the ones that appear to be fact. Right. So the things that we think to be true, like the world is flat. Yes, yeah. And then we discover that, that can be very disruptive. Right, right. right? And so Agile seeks to optimize for um, dealing with that phenomenon, right? So we're going to do things like um, ensure our work is highly collaborative. We're gonna involve our stakeholders and our customers as early as possible in the design process. Um, and then also, we're going to um, prioritize functioning product or simulations of functioning product over specifications. So that's prototyping up. A whole lot. Yeah, that's, and in fact, that's, um, proto the word prototype did not appear in the Agile Manifesto, but I think the prototype is the best way to, um, they talked a lot about functioning software mm -hmm. over specifications. Because in, in the back, um, in the early days of software, we're, we were essentially um, borrowing from manufacturing. We were like, well, this is how it works in manufacturing, so naturally we're going to, we're, we're building things, so let's just follow these same, same um, routines. And what we realized was that um, there were a lot, there was a lot of risk in that, right? Because these assumptions found their way into, uh, into the design and then we built it and then it was a bit late because then we had to unravel things. And um, 
you know, software, the later you discover a bug or issue, the more costly it is yeah. to fix. And I would argue that's the same in hardware, if not even more expensive, because you've committed to like, you know, this big build or right. this big order. Uh, and so the, as much as we can move learnings to the left and get them early as possible, the better. And then also, um, I think born out of agile is this kind of incremental mindset, right? How can we reduce our batch size? Because the bigger the batch, the, the more risk there is in it. The more you can reduce the batch, the, the smaller your blast radius, yeah. the faster you can move. So how can we decompose things in a way that like we can go test this one thing and understand it? So in a, in a sense, for those of us who, who are building hardware, there's a certain sense of designing a level of modularity into what you do, right? Because mm -hmm. if I understand you correctly, instead of having two months to a preliminary design review and another two months to a critical design review or longer or whatnot, we're going to take that into a much smaller chunk of time and a smaller deliverable that needs to be able to stand on its own. Do I have that right? That's right. And then you're going to build that iteratively around this concept of a design sprint, right? Yeah. So Do I have that right? Um, I would I maybe step back and explain the design sprint a little bit. Okay. I, I think it's... Um, you know, you could refer to it as heavy artillery, right? It's a <laughs> it's a five day process where we're going to go deep on something. It's uh, accelerates innovation. It can get a project unstuck. Um, highly effective at getting a team highly aligned. I talked about those assumptions, yeah. and I mean a, a really bad phenomenon, and it happens. I see it time and time and time again working with Fortune 100 companies. I mean these people have stuff figured out, but it's pervasive. We're using the same word to mean different things. Like we hear, we're hearing it and we're, it seems on the surface there's agreement, but we need to dive deeper and have a more in-depth conversation and explore things a little more than what people are typically used to doing. And the design sprint's really great at that, creating this alignment. Um, it, it's also going to, we're, we're going to create a prototype and test it in some way. And that could be with stakeholders, sometimes with employees, like if we're mm -hmm. working on employee experience or like a, um, I've, we've, we've worked with HR teams before where we're turning this process inward. Um, and often we'll bring in customers or clients to kind of look at where we're, um, where we're anticipating going. But the, the critical thing is that we start off with a very well-articulated goal and right. I think that's where a lot of people falter. And whether it's a design sprint or these other kinds of workshops we're doing, it could be a strategic leadership session. Um, I just see a lot of times there's that lack of alignment, and then right. the, and, the, and it's the goal is not super crisp. And that could be because we've gone too wide. Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of times when people are thinking about innovation, they're like, oh, we don't oh, yeah. want to limit ourselves. But if you think about trying to s solve world peace mm -hmm. uh, or world hunger, it's like, hmm. That's like that's a yeah. bit like daunting. Yeah. But if we constrain it in some way, maybe we focus on one country, or maybe we figure out one specific problem that we see, and we're going to rally to like um, kind of fix that, right? So I can I can see where it, the, everything that you're doing turns into more of this this holistic approach to solving problems. Absolutely. So let, let's bind it and stay in the design because yeah. as someone who runs an engineering company, I'm very keen to to sure. to get better at this, right? So for those of us who are designing systems of systems, right? Uh, it's very common in, uh, in, in our history in past and waterfall is exactly like you say, is, is that on paper, in a Microsoft project, and in all, you know, in CAD, and, and, and in PCB designs and, and whatnot, we have all of that done before we cut the first piece of metal or find, you know, apply power to anything. And it's clear to me I, that's, that's a mistake, right? The more that I can move the risk inherent with all of that to the left, as you said in the schedule, that just in my gut makes sense. So walk me through, counsel me as far as I've got a system of systems design. How should I, at the kickoff of, of a program, how do I how do I understand how to find where is that risk? How, what are those small design sprints? Help me get started. Sure, sure. You know, I think um, alignment and being clear on the goal is super critical. So uh, everyone that's involved, your stakeholders, like making sure that uh, that we've gone really deep on unpacking the problem. Right. And that that's always a great place to start. Like. Um, and I find a lot of times people really struggle with this purpose-driven work. 
because per, getting to a real deep purpose is, is often difficult, right? Um, and it's, it's hard work. So starting there is important. Also breaking things down. So you talked about modularity. So understanding yes. where those interfaces are mm -hmm. and starting to define the signatures and interfaces for these different systems. So now we know how they're talking together and now we can all go and, um, and work on these things in parallel. But the critical thing is that we don't wanna go, we wanna make sure we have continuous integration points, right? right. And that there's a high degree of communication one of my favorite stories is um, the, the, the kind of the race to space. In Europe, you know, where different countries were working on different components of the rocket, whereas, you know, we as a nation were very integrated. But NASA was very smart in the fact that they realized that this integration was going to be an issue and that they spent a bunch of time building communication tools mm -hmm. to make sure the different teams that were working on the different components were able to communicate and the information was flowing succinctly and quickly. And so it's important not only to, you know, to make sure every, the edges have autonomy and that people can move in parallel and you've got kind of, you've agreed on how the things are going to communicate, but you're testing this stuff regularly. And um, so your integration is kind of continuously tested, but mm -hmm. also that you take a step back like NASA did and survey the landscape and go, what kind of orthogonal things or what adjacent things do we need to work on that will help the team be more effective? So our, our, is our process working? Do we have the best communication we can? Where, like, and even listening out, it's like you're QCing the way you work. Right. right? Are you, and you're realizing like, ooh, that, it, that was a bad, we got lucky here. That could have been a lot worse. And how do, how do we luck out? And then next time, how can we design something so we don't rely on luck, but we intentionally surface that? Right. It would seem that NASA could go back to that, re revisit that, it, whether it be SpaceX, Blue Origin, Rocket Lab, Firefly, go down the list. It seems like the, the tables have turned. Yeah, well, it's, it's a different world we live in, right? right. Um, we have a lot of, I mean, at the point where it was NASA versus Europe, so to speak, um, we just didn't have commercialization of technology right. the way we do now. And it's kind of hard for government agencies to compete with, you know, with companies that are, have a lot more, the incentives are just different. 